Hey everybody, I'm Mike Sattel, the founder of Sattel Tutoring, and in this video I'm going to talk about the top 10 grammar rules that you need to know for the SAT. Grammar is an easy place to improve your SAT score because it's very, very predictable. They don't ask about all of the complicated grammar rules in English. They really only ask about a limited set. I'm not going to be able to get into all of them in this video. I'm just going to cover the top 10, but if you subscribe to my channel, you will get information every time I release a new video that covers a new grammar rule or one of these rules in much more detail. I'll put those videos in the description, so keep checking back, but this is really just meant to be a video to get you started on your prep and just know which rules are the most uh, important to prioritize or which rules you need to absolutely memorize if you're taking the test tomorrow. Make sure you watch this that you can save a couple extra points. But let's get into it. The 10th most important grammar rule has to do with commas. Commas indicate a break in the sentence structure. Now the comma is probably the most important punctuation mark and yet it's 10th on this list. And the reason is that commas have lots of rules that are very hard to memorize. And so it's not really a good idea to memorize each individual comma rule. Instead, if we just memorize that they show a break in the sentence structure, then whenever we're told to think about commas and the answer choices, we can just try to think about the overall structure of the sentence. In these two examples, you can see in bold what constitutes the independent clause, the main sentence that we're talking about in each in each case. And then the comma shows where we're adding on extra information. So in example one, we have the main sentence in the middle, and then the commas are used to show where we're putting extra clauses at the beginning and at the end. Yet in the second example, we also use two commas, but this time they're used to interrupt the main sentence and stick an extra clause right in the middle. So that's the thing with commas. They're very unpredictable in the sense that there's lots of ways that we can use them to build sentences. But no matter what's going on, they're pretty much always going to show that transition point between a main sentence and an extra clause. So anytime you see them in the answer choices, try to pick the sentence apart and put it back together again. What are all these pieces doing? How do they fit together? Where's your main sentence? Where are your extra clauses? One of the most difficult places to do, that, to do this is with appositives, okay? Now you know what an appositive is even if you've never heard that word before. You definitely use this in your own writing. It's basically when we use an extra description to give us more information about the main noun in a sentence. So does it get commas or not? Well, it really depends. So in these two examples, we're basically saying the exact same thing. But notice one of them has two commas, the other has no commas. In both cases, the bolded part is what I would consider the positive, the extra description. What is it an extra description of? It is a description of Hiroshi Tanaka. That's the main specific name that we're using to kind of center the sentence. The other piece, a molecular biologist at the University of Vancouver, is just extra information about Hiroshi Tanaka. Now, when the main specific name comes first, we usually add the extra information afterwards using two commas. But when the main specific name comes second, the extra description can kind of just flow into it without any commas. So that's the difference between the top and the bottom. In the top one, the specific name is first, so we use two commas to add the description after it. In the second example, the main name is second, so we can just kind of flow without any commas into from the description into that name. It's very tricky, but hopefully these two examples show you the difference between the commas and no commas. Rules eight and seven are both related. They're both have to to do with pronouns. Now, rule number eight, you can't get wrong. First and foremost, we need to just know the difference between it's without an apostrophe and it's with an apostrophe. If we have it's with an apostrophe, it is a contraction for the two words it is. It behaves very similar to, similarly to there, where we have they are and the apostrophe is showing the contraction of those two words. Those two answers are almost never going to be right on the SAT. They're going to be answer choices, but they're usually wrong because what really matters is rule number seven, where we have to think about the other versions of the word words, it's, and they are the possessive pronouns. And even though they're possessive, they do not get apostrophes. English is weird. We'll talk more about apostrophes later. For now, just know that it's without an apostrophe is the singular possessive pronoun and there is the plural possessive pronoun. So we need to think about whether or not the thing we're talking about is singular or plural and that can get tricky. So be careful. Notice in the first sentence, the team won its first game. Now a team has lots of players on it, but it's still just one team, which is why we use the singular pronoun it's. Whereas the second version of the sentence is very similar. The players won their first game. Well, 
well, it's multiple players. So that's why we use the plural pronoun there. This is a rule that we often get wrong when we talk. So it's very important that when we see it in uh, getting tested in the answer choices, we actually make an effort to apply the rule. Don't just go by your instincts. Apply the rule. Think about singulars and plurals. Now, as I said, apostrophes are tricky because most of the time they're used to show possession. But as we saw, possessive pronouns don't get apostrophes. When we see apostrophes on pronouns, they are used for contraction. But most of the time when they're on regular old nouns, they are showing possession. So we can see here in this sentence, the professor's assistants were late. Well, the professor possesses the assistants. They belong to him. The assistants, though, they don't possess anything, so there's no apostrophe on that word. So don't get confused between words with apostrophes and normal regular plurals. Most of the time that the SAT tests apostrophes, we really just need to think about whether the apostrophe belongs in the sentence at all. So just think about yes or no. Now, that usually gets you the answer, but occasionally they'll ask about where the apostrophe goes on the word. So that's why I have dogs here written twice. If it's a singular noun, it usually is that we're going to add the apostrophe and the S. But if it's a plural noun, it probably already has an S, so we're just going to add the apostrophe. Like I said, though, that part of the rule rarely comes up. It may look like it's coming up, but the first thing you should think about is whether or not you need an apostrophe at all. That might be enough to get the question right. Number five is about the double dash. Another punctuation mark that you might not use very often in your own writing, but is very easy to use. It behaves a lot like a comma. So in this case, we have a sentence. The museum contained over 200 examples of scrimshaw dating back to the 17th century. And we're using two dashes to insert this extra piece into the middle. Artistic carvings into whalebone. That's basically just a description of what scrimshaw is. So the two dashes indicate where that extra piece begins and ends. Now, we don't have to use dashes. We could use two commas. We could use parentheses. But on the SAT, what's going to happen is they're going to make the decision for you which one is they're going to use. So a lot of times you're not really deciding whether you need a dash or a comma. You already have made the, or the SAT has already made the decision for you, and you're just making a symmetrical decision at the beginning or the end. So just look out. If you already see a dash, it's probably the case that you need a second dash somewhere else to, to separate that extra clause. But again, even dashes, it's really coming down to sentence structure. What counts as the main sentence? What is an extra clause? Another rule that really gives us trouble, number four here, is about verb agreement. And the reason this is so high on the list, even though it's not a rule that's tested very often, is that it's very tricky. And if we know to look for it, we're actually really likely to get these points. What's going to happen is if we see answer choices that involve verbs, our brain is instantly going to go to past, present, future. And that does get tested on the SAT, but usually that's very easy to recognize. So when we see these kinds of choices, our brain is going to be like, oh, do I need the is, the present tense, or the was, the past tense? But that's not always what matters. Instead, try to think about singulars and plurals, similar to the way we did with pronouns. Singular verbs usually end in S, and we need to use those verbs when we have a singular subject. The subject is the thing that does the verb. And so we need plural verbs when we have a plural subject. And a lot of times this is easy to recognize because one of the answers will be singular and the other three will be plural. And so you'd be like, okay, the singular one's probably right because then the plural three are wrong or vice versa. So this is just about recognizing a rule that otherwise is going to be disguised on you. So make sure that you remember that this rule exists because honestly, that's half the battle of just getting these questions right. The next rule involves colons. And this is another case where we have a, a tough time because we have a, a rule poorly memorized. We are told for some reason that colons are used for lists. This is a fake rule. This is not really true. Yes, some lists are going to have colons. But on the SAT, most lists do not have colons, and most colons are not used for lists. So that is not a reliable way to think about it. Instead, you want to think about the structure of the sentence. For all punctuation, that's really what it comes down to. What is the structure of the sentence? Before the colon, we need to have a complete, full sentence, OK? After the colon, we can have lots of different things. We can have a sentence. We can have just one word if we really want to. And usually that second part is going to explain or answer some sort of implied question from the first part. So you can see in the examples, I have one fear. That's a sentence. What is that one fear? Spiders. He was furious. That's a sentence. What was he furious about? Someone had stolen his favorite painting. So you can see that's how the colon works. But if we see it in the answer choice, the first thing you want to check is whether or not the part before the colon is a complete sentence that could stand on its own and end with a period. You can also sometimes use a single dash to replace a colon. There really isn't any difference between the two. So just be aware that the dash can also come in, in ones, and it usually is being used just like this as a colon. So again, you would want to have a complete sentence beforehand. 
The next rule also has to deal with sentence structure. You can see a theme here that punctuation and sentence structure is a very big part of the SAT. Now, there are lots of ways to join two complete sentences on the SAT. Sometimes a colon is one of them, but a more common way that we do every day in our own writing is using a comma and a conjunction, a word like and, but, or, so. These words allow us to join two sentences together, but if we're going to do it, we need to have a comma as well. Uh, usually a conjunction by itself is not enough, and a comma by itself is not enough to join two complete sentences. So you can see here in the example, I am late to the meeting. That's a sentence. We could end a period right there. The presentation is not in my briefcase. That's a sentence. It could stand alone. So if we're going to join them together with a conjunction, we also need the comma. This is tricky because in real life, if the sentences are really, really short, we actually don't need the comma. But on the SAT, that's not going to happen because the sentences will be long enough. So just pay attention. Anytime you see punctuation coming and going in the answer choices, it probably matters for the entire sentence. You should think about sentence structure because we need to decide whether or not we're connecting sentences in a legitimate way or if we're creating a run on by not doing it the right way and using only a comma or only a conjunction. And that brings us to our final rule, which is also about sentence structure. And it's probably, in a way, the easiest way to get 10 points on your SAT. Know how to use a semicolon. OK. A semicolon is basically the exact same thing as a period. You need to have a complete sentence both before and after the semicolon. So in these two examples, they're both complete sentences. You personally would probably use a period to separate them, but we could use a semicolon, and there literally is no difference. The only reason to use a period is it's more common and more normal. The semicolon is kind of weird because it really doesn't have much of a function beyond just being a period that's kind of strange. So the most useful way to think about a semicolon in the SAT is to think about the multiple choices that you're going to get. If you have two answer choices, and they're the same exact wording, but one is a semicolon and one is a period, cross them both out. They both are saying the exact same thing because a semicolon is a period. So if they both are the same, they cannot both be right, so they must both be wrong. And that now doubles your odds of getting a question right. So there's one thing to remember from this video. It's this. If you see a semicolon and a period in answer choices and the wording of the choices is the same, cross out both the answer choices. It is probably the case that both are wrong. And now you can think about whatever else is going on in the sentence without that stuff confusing you. Hopefully, you got more than just that out of this video, though. So make sure that you uh, subscribe to this channel if you want to get more information, more detail about any of these rules. I really hope, though, that this is a great way to get some extra points on the test if you are taking it tomorrow or if you're just starting in your prep. These are all really great things to dive into more deeply because there are nuances to some of these rules that I will cover in other videos on my channel. But thank you so much for watching. And if you are taking the test tomorrow, best of luck. I think you're going to do great.